cool. Okay, this is my first one, so be nice, okay? Um, so I'm Nathaniel, I'm a co-founder at SR2, Socially Responsible Recruitment. Um, and when I learned that this month's PHP Southwest was going to be focused around coding horror stories, I thought to myself, I'm in an industry that is so full of horror stories, it could fill up the central library 10 times over. And that is true. Um, the opportunist in me thought this would be a great time for me to share some. So we'll start this evening calling on a reliable source of mine to get a snapshot of people's thoughts on recruiters. Now, oh, it's a bit blurry, but I'll read through them quickly. But essentially, if you type into Google, I don't know how many of you have tried this, recruiters are. This is what comes up. So they're pretty harsh. There's scum, the worst, parasites, annoying, a waste of time, useless, liars, scumbags. The only one that isn't horrible, like really horrible, is looking for. <laughs> and then the last one's terrible. So yeah, basically, some of the stories that I'm about to share back up these claims. And you'll see, you'll see why. These stories are all real. They have been anonymized. Some may be shocked by what they're about to hear. Therefore, listeners' discretion is advised. So, story number one, <clears throat> I'll call deceit. You could call them all deceit, really. But it's about a young lad who's not having a great time in his current role. He's, a new boss has come in and he's given a bit, bit of a hard time. So he does what anyone else would do. He procrastinates for a few weeks, and then he thinks, right, I need to sort this out. I, I need to upload my CV to Indeed, which he does. The next morning, he is absolutely inundated with calls. And by 8 a.m., he's on double figures. By 12 p.m., he's 28 calls deep. And I'm one of them. And so I talked to him about his situation and we have a chat about what's happening in his current job and kind of cover off, is it something that's salvageable? Can, can you have a conversation with your manager and try and sort things out? But it's clear that that's not going to happen. So we have a chat about what his ideal role would be. Will it be full stack? Will it be... Um, back-end, product, agency, Laravel, Cake, etc. But he's quite clear on what he doesn't want, okay? And what he doesn't want is an agency or a role involving CMS. Sorry to WordPress people out there. Um, <clears throat> so he's very clear about that. So I send him some specs for some roles that I think might fit, and we agreed to catch up at 12 o'clock that day. And I give him a call as arranged, and we talk through the specs and work out which ones will fit. I ask him how his morning went and whether the onslaught of calls continued, to which he said, yes, I'm at 28, but I've actually got an interview. Fantastic. It's in five minutes' time. What? Okay. Um, and he offers up the name of the company. It's anonymized. We call it Webbot. It's not a name I immediately recognise, but it does ring a bell. It sounds similar to a company that I work with who are an agency. So I say to him, are you sure it's not Webbox? To which he replies, no, it's definitely Webbot. Now, I don't want to rub this guy out the wrong way, and he's five minutes away from an interview. So I, I leave it there. And we agree to catch up at the end of the day. In the evening, I get a call from the candidate, and he is nothing short of seething. He is so angry. The recruiter had not only lied about the role being non-CMS, he also had lied about the role being non-agency. And if that wasn't enough, he had changed the name of the company slightly, not completely, slightly, to throw the candidate off the scent, and then used urgency as a way of saying, we haven't got time to send you specs, just jump on the call, it's going to give you a call at 12.15, go. And, and, and use that as a, a way of tricking this guy into taking the call. He was, he was pretty angry, and obviously it didn't go anywhere. 
<clears throat> yeah. <laughs> now, you could argue that that is incredibly naive and trusting to accept an interview without being fully briefed on a role. And I would agree, that said, recruiters are persuasive creatures and the story highlights they will often lie to get what they want. So the one takeaway from this, if a recruiter is not being forthright with information, ask yourself why. They don't want you to have all the information because if you had it all, you wouldn't take the call. <laughs> so that was story number one. That was pretty tame. Oh. Story number two, you've probably guessed. I call it Glastonbury. <clears throat> it's fairly similar. So we've got a developer looking for work. His CV's on the open market. He's had a few interviews with clients of mine, so we're catching up, sharing feedback. And once we've covered everything, I ask how you're getting on with things. And he says, I've actually got an interview with a company based in Glastonbury that are moving to Bristol. Great, I say. Wrap up the call, I'll get on with my day. Two days later, I get another interview request for this guy. So I give him a call to get his availability. I then ask about the Glastonbury interview, to which he responds, don't ask. And I think, what, why? And he tells me that he was en route to the interview, probably somewhere down here. And he got a call from the recruiter. And after the initial exchanging of pleasantries, the recruiter made a really strange request. He requested that the candidate didn't mention the Bristol move because it hadn't yet been made public. <laughs> Now, he's in Glastonbury, surrounded by farms, and there is a distinct smell of horseshit. But this is just too much. This is just too much. So as soon as he arrives at the interview, the first thing he asks is, are you moving to Bristol? To which they respond, no. So it's just mind-blowing. Like, how? What? How? What? And my major problem with this is why? Like, what do they actually think is going to happen? Like, do they think that this charade is going to continue long enough that the candidates will just be like, you know what, I'm just going to take my kids out of school, I'm going to pack my bags, come on, we're going to Glastonbury, we're going to live in Glastonbury from now on. It's just not going to happen. It's far too much for my mind to process. Once again. Pages are stuck together. Right, so final, yeah, that sounded dodgier than it should have sounded. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> right, final story. And if the first two haven't shocked you, this one definitely will. Right, a developer, for the purpose of this story, John, nice wholesome name, he speaks to a recruiter. John informs the recruiter, I'll call the recruiter Lucifer, <laughs> that he's at the latter stages of interviewing somewhere and it's a job that he's really keen on and if he gets offered it, he's going to accept it. Now, Lucifer has a job and a wallet to fill so rather than just wishing John well being on his way, he fakes intrigue and starts probing for more information. Oh great, he says, who's that with? John, thinking nothing of it, <clears throat> Shares the name of the company. Thank you for that. Ah, yes, I know them, Lucifer says, as he Googles the company. They do that development thing? Is it Bob you're speaking with? John, again, being perhaps a little too naive, says, oh no, it's Mark. Lucifer wraps up the call. Later that day, Lucifer calls John again, feigning interest, feigning interest in his well-being, and he asks, what's the latest, John? Uh, and John says, super happy, got the offer, and I've accepted it. I'm handing in my notice tomorrow. Now, the next day, something really peculiar happens, and, and dreaded for anyone. He gets a call from the company. It's, John, we're really sorry, but we're going to have to retract the offer. We've had a business update and instruction to freeze hiring with immediate effect. Mark sends his deepest apologies. 
Well, naturally, John is absolutely devastated. He's handed in his notice to his company and he runs the risk of being left without work. But then, out of nowhere, sent from above or below, Lucifer calls him, just checking in. And obviously, John, without a job now, proceeds to pursue the job that Lucifer had in mind. Until later that day, he gets a call from Mark. <laughs> How are you getting on with that contract, John? I just thought I'd um, give you a quick call to check and run through the stock options with you. John's obviously very confused at this point. For those of you that didn't follow, the recruiter had posed as the client, or at least got a colleague to do so, to convince the candidate the offer had been retracted in order to free up the candidate for one of his jobs. This is a true story. Fucked up. <laughs> Man. Shitbags? <laughs> so I should, I should let you out that so. <laughs> Right. So some, some takeaways for you, OK? I haven't gone too long, but insist on information, whether that be specs, links to websites, manager's name, get them to tell you about the culture. What do they know about the culture? Don't know, if they don't know any of this stuff, ask yourself why. Do they actually work with this company? And do not interview without that information. And then if you're planning on looking for work, do not rush. Developers, all of you, are in demand, okay? Take your time, update your CV, fully and then do some research before you go diving in. Who are other people recommending and why? Who's pasting relevant job adverts? Who seems to know their clients? Apply for specific jobs. Root out local recruiters who specialise in the, your area of expertise or put your CV in the public domain. But if you do so, just know that you will be inundated with calls, texts, perhaps even letters. And you will speak with some shitheads uh, who, and, and they will try and skin you for information. One of my first interviews as a recruiter, that was the terminology used to, to getting information out of candidates. Skin them for information. I told you you'd hate recruiters after. <laughs> um, if you're going to do it that way, buy a burner phone, buy a portable charger, set up a jobs email address and get a good, good night's rest. Oh, <laughs> so recruiters are these things often, okay, but thankfully not all recruiters are created equal. There are some good, even great ones out there. I've had the pleasure of meeting and working with some of them, and I still do, I have to say that. Um, <laughs> so good ones will be passionate about what they do, they'll work very hard, often long hours, to try and help you find something. And most importantly, they'll be honest and have your best interests at heart. We're nearly there, don't you worry. Find a good one and don't let it go. <laughs> do not let it go. Also, if they're being transparent with you, reciprocate. Tell it how it is. Don't get a 70k offer and then go AWOL. Don't, go, don't talk down to the recruiter or be reading the news when he's taking you for coffee to better get to know you. True story. This one's shocking. Don't, a week into your new job, use the company laptop for extracurricular activities. <laughs> True story. And don't cancel your interview because you're suddenly in a different country with no international dial code. And then arrange, rearrange, only to fake a car accident to get out of the subsequent <laughs> interview. Also a true story. <laughs> um, treat them as you'd like to be treated. Finally, parting note, this is your career. The decisions you make when looking for work will impact on your life, on your well-being, on your happiness, and most likely those things for the people around you. Give the job seeking process the respect it deserves. Give yourself the respect you deserve and don't settle for bullshit. Thank you. <laughs>